Good afternoon, everyone, and uh, thanks for joining the Florida Food Policy Council's monthly Florida Food Forum, uh, hosted by the Policy Committee of the Council. I'm Del Deschant, uh, Associate Chair of the Department of Religious Studies at USF and host of the Florida Food Forum. We welcome to all who are joining on our cyber systems or phone lines today, and we welcome all who are accessing our program in the future through the magic of a recording of today's event. Our topic for this month is community gardens, what's been done, what's ahead. With us from the council is the council's operations and communications manager, Kendra Love. Kendra will handle the technical and managerial aspects of the meeting. I'm asking Kendra to let us know when we have five minutes left in the program. We are also asking viewers and listeners to submit questions using the chat box function of this connection, and this allows for more questions. Uh, Kendra, uh, please tell us a little bit about the chat box and other technical features of the broadcast. So uh, if you are joining us on a phone, um, at, I believe it's at the top of the screen. So if you have a question during the forum, you can type it in there. Once we get to our question and answer session, uh, we will take your questions. If you're on a computer, you'll be able to see at the bottom of the screen, there's a little bar. Um, next to the, the hand symbol, there's a little show conversation box. So if at any time during the forum, if you do have a question, please type it in there and we will get to that at the end. Thank you, Kendra. Uh, we want to take just a moment and let everyone know that Florida Food Policy Council relies on donations, memberships, and sponsorships uh, for our operations. We are a chartered not-for-profit organization dedicated to advancing the health and security of the Florida food system. Please share support through the donation link on our website. And for information on sponsoring a future program, see our website or contact our operations and communication director, Kendra Love. We're pleased to recognize the sponsors of this month's Florida Food Forum, FHEED and J. Haskins Law. FHEED stands for Florida or stands for Food for Health, the Environment, Economy, and Democracy. Based in Fort Lauderdale, FHEED is a consultancy dedicated to the ideals of its name. It specializes in food systems planning, GIS analysis, advocacy, and education about food systems and healthy communities. The contact for FHEED is Anthony Oliveri. J. Haskins Law, our other sponsor, is located in Tampa. It empowers communities with legal and risk management tools needed to exercise food sovereignty. The contact for J. Haskins Law is Jesse Haskins. We are most appreciative of our two sponsors, FHEED and J. Haskins Law, for sponsoring this forum for this month. For information on sponsoring future forums, again, see our website or contact our operations and communications manager, Kendra Love. Thank you to all. The focus of this edition of Florida Food Forum is community gardens. A document introducing our presenters for today is posted on the council's website. And if you registered for our event today, you have seen the introduction. As always, my introductions of the presenters will be brief, so please do take a look at the website for more details on the history and achievement of our special and distinguished panelists. I will note that there is a tremendous interest in community gardens. This has been growing for well over a decade, but it seems to have accelerated recently. This is due in part to the devastating impact of COVID-19 and the pandemic that's still sweeping the country which has impacted food security and brought a heightened awareness of the fragility of the industrial food system. It has also inspired many to embrace local food production, led others to network and organize food sovereignty projects, and greatly expanded participation in community gardens. So as with so many of our other Florida food forums, this is a particularly timely topic. To tell us more about community gardens, we are fortunate to have two experienced community garden organizers and leaders, Judith Gluco and Kitty Wallace. Judith is an 
ecological edible landscape designer and co-founder and co-organizer of the Rotary Community Garden and Food Forest in Coral Springs, Florida. She is also co-founder of the Florida Permaculture Convergence. Kitty is a retired educator and past president of the Tampa Garden Club. She is garden coordinator of the Tampa Heights Community Garden, which was named best community garden in the state by the Florida Federation of Garden Clubs. She is co-founder of the Coalition of Community Gardens, Tampa Bay. We are honored to have both of our distinguished leaders with us for this month's forum. We'll get things started with Judith's pr presentation, then turn to Kitty. Following Kitty's presentation, we'll open the forum to questions. Please use the chat box to submit your questions, and I'll ask Kendra to field the questions for us. So, without further ado, please join me in welcoming Judith Gluco. Judith? Is that better? Is yes, that better? Oh, okay. yeah. okay. that's wonderful. I don't, I don't know how I got muted. Okay, thank you, Dell. Um, Kendra, do you have my slides? Yes, I am. Okay, so I'm very excited to be here and to be presenting with Kitty, and I think that there are some people who showed up who are in my garden and who are in some of the other South Florida gardens. And uh, whenever, I guess after Kitty's talk, or I, I don't know exactly how it works, I'd love to hear from them too. But I have a lot of slides, kind of scared Kendra, but a lot of them are pictures. It will be fine. <laughs> <laughs> How's that? Good. Uh, I'm hearing something in the background. Okay. Okay. So um, I'm going to be highlighting some, certainly not all, of the South Florida Community Gardens, highlighting some and focusing on you know some of the good deeds and some of the challenges and some some of the some of the wonderful things so you can uh, change slides okay so these are the gardens that i'm going to be highlighting there are others as well um, and yeah i realize most of them are in broward and palm beach and really haven't touched miami it's strange down here how there's such a separation but uh can't cover everything Okay, continuing. So the garden I helped co-found along with the Rotary Club, and I think uh, our Rotary liaison Scott Jablon is on today, so that's wonderful. The Rotary sponsored us with the city, so we were set up well from the start, uh, but we volunteers and residents run the garden. Our mission is to teach people to, how to grow food, um, to build community, and we're really passionate about bringing in plants, the botanical aspect of bringing in plants that thrive here, um, providing a healthy ecosystem for plants, people, pollinators, and other animals. Next slide. We are not a food desert, so I'm happy to also highlight other gardens where there are food deserts. Uh, apparently, Coral Springs has a median income of $72,000, so definitely not a food desert. But most of our gardeners live in condos or apartments, so we are providing land for them. And we also do grow crops for food banks. Um, yeah, next slide. We are on city land in a park. We have a fenced in community area with an adjacent unfenced food forest, which is really uh, an experiment in the, in the commons. Uh, so we get some thefts and we get a lot of donations and good works too. We'll literally have plants show up uh, where people want, want to donate it. We also have a memorial for Parkland, uh, the Marjorie Stoneman Douglas shooting February 14, 2018, was just up the road. And tragically, one of our gardeners, her daughter was one of the 17 killed and that just became sort of part of the divine design to also have a memorial as part of the garden. Next slide. So this is just where it is in a huge uh, park with three schools and, and sports fields and a swimming pool uh, and a nature center. Next slide. Uh, and the city supportive and the land is likely to be there and undeveloped as opposed to gardens I'll get to in a few minutes where development is an issue. This is our labyrinth. The landscaping is a little more developed since then. Uh, this is a Cretan labyrinth. It's a meditation. It's got seven circuits and people love it. Next slide. <laughs> Next slide. 
So this is Anne Ramsey, who lost her daughter Helena uh, with one of our labyrinth signs. Next. Thank you, Kendra, for doing this. These are a bunch of our volunteers on a work day in the fenced in part of the garden. You can see garden boxes behind there, four by eight. We have 54 of them, uh, $40 a year. Next slide. Yeah, another next. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> Not great. Next slide. Yes. <laughs> this is uh, these next few you could just go through pretty quickly are just the food forest parts of the food forest. Yeah, that's a uh, that's a chipotle cabbage tree, mame growing up, a black sapote over on that side. Next one. Okay. So the Fruitful Field is a community garden in um, Pompano Beach, east of us, definitely in a food desert. And their mission is serving underprivileged populations and educating youth. Next slide. Uh, they're on a church property. Uh, they are very committed to giving away food. They now uh, donate about four tons of food a year. And they have a very cool program that for every community supported agriculture share, someone purchases, uh, a share is donated to a family in need. And they also have a weekly farm stand. Um, they've been supported, next slide. Uh, they've been supported by grants, community, uh, 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 what is that, community, I always forget what that is. Redis Foundation. What's the CRA again, community? I'm blanking. Re Redevelopment re agency. Redevelopment agency. Thank you. Uh, through that grant, they were able to start a second garden, and uh, they created something called Grow City Youth. And Grow City fosters hands-on gardening, healthy cooking, healthy eating, among its many objectives. Uh, and they get paid, paid internships. Next slide. Here are some of them. Next slide. Next. <laughs> Next. So here's their outdoor kitchen. Uh, Chris Resor is our current director. Their former director and co-founder, Flavio uh, Slotes, told me a story once of they were so excited giving away this food to kids to bring home. And then one of the kids said, you know, our parents are throwing it out because they don't know how, what to do with it. They yeah. don't know what to do with fresh produce. So they had this wonderful response and they built this outdoor kitchen and they also teach cooking. This is their, CS, uh, their CSAs and the farm stand. They have a beautiful hoop house that they just built. Okay, so I know I'm racing a little, but hopefully you're getting a sense. Uh, 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 to do this talk, I had such an opportunity to go visit the Delray Beach Children's Garden, which I'd been meaning to do for a couple of years. So I'm so grateful this talk motivated me to do it. Co-founded by Shelley Zacks and Jeannie Fernsworth. Jeannie is a botanist. Um, Shelley Zacks is a retired school teacher. And Christine is the garden director. And this garden was designed by children uh, and along permaculture principles. And um, one of the things I love is they've also designed in an area where grown-ups aren't allowed, which is so wonderful. Secret for <laughs> garden at the edges, right? They have a teen council, and they service like 50 homeschool children with weekly classes and mommy and me classes. Part of their challenge is they're in downtown Delray Beach, which is a very desirable little town down here, uh, and they're on church ground. Their original vision... Years ago, they charged them like, I don't know, $10 a month, but then things change and they're being charged quite a bit more than that now. So they have, that is one of their challenges, that rule changed. Next slide. Uh, but they're super creative and resilient and figuring out ways to, that'll be the next slide, I guess, figuring out ways to come up with that money. Their mission is eco-consciousness and children's garden education, um, adventure education and play, and uh, Jeannie talked to me, which I loved about the Olmsted Quaker principles of having a place of organizing, a place of greeting, a place of gathering, and a place of meeting. And they're very into citizen science. Next slide. Uh, so for example, one of the things they do is they grow cotton and they sell cotton in, in this time of COVID and sanitizer. 
Uh, next slide. So this is one of the designers, a child of the flower garden, which I think is so lovely. Next slide. And you can just scroll through the next few slides. I love their little logo. That's such a cute picture. Okay, so the next garden I want to focus so focus on is Lauderdale Lakes. I don't know, I hope Beverly is here. Beverly is an amazing master gardener, little celebrity in South Florida. She's the founder, master gardener, who's the founder of the Lauderdale Lakes Community Garden, and she has recently also become vice mayor. Um, it's totally a food desert, Lauderdale Lakes, and um, the whole garden's on raised beds, not in ground. For many of our gardens, development is always the monster that we're dealing with. Um, this garden is mobile. It could get picked up and moved at any point, and that's part of folded into its design. I'm hearing somebody. Um, next slide. Beverly's here. I just want to say hello. Hi, Beverly. I'm so glad you're here. Yay, wonderful. <laughs> How do I mute myself again? <laughs> um, they feed an Alzheimer's daycare. And they, uh, with collards, carrots, all kinds of things. They also have a children's garden nearby. And then they recently renamed it the Frank Coleman Garden after a garden co-founder who passed. And they teach organic gardening. And I wish I could do each of these gardens so much more uh, justice. And I know Jeannie from the last garden, the Delray uh, Beach Children's Garden was here as well. We'd had such a wonderful conversation. Uh, so great to to see it and to meet her. Next next slide. I just Whoa. love this slide. I know, right? <laughs> Look at what they did. This huge group. That's going to the Alzheimer's daycare. The the hatchback is filled with carrots. I know. That was my reaction. Kitty. Whoa. <laughs> okay. Next slide. And there's Beverly. And you see the way they are. The concrete blocks. This can get moved if it need to. And they grow so much abundance of food. And uh, I've heard Beverly's yard is magical as well. I would love to visit that one day. Next. Okay. The Highland Gardens Community Garden um, was in a space in Hollywood from about 2008 to 2018. It was always going to be temporary, but finally, but it felt permanent. So they put in a whole permaculture food forest area. Uh, uh, co -found, founded by Maria Radcliffe with a lot of help recently from Adriana Algieri. Finally, it was full, sold to a developer. There was affordable um, senior housing, but the city wasn't interested in keeping a garden there for that, which would have been perfect. The garden had to go. Next slide. Oh. Yeah. So Maria is lesson in resilience. She um, relocated part of the garden to a private school in Hollywood, and they've recently developed the East Hollywood Food Yard project. They are up to 12 food yards, and they have Food Yard Fridays where they garden people's yards. And they just started a new space for kids on diversion. You cannot keep a passionate, connected woman down for lots of us. So that is part of the theme but it is obviously more ideal when you have city support. Next slide. Yeah, so that was part of it. Next slide. That's Maria. Next slide. One of the food yards. Next. So then the last garden, I did not get a chance yet to speak to Rita. Uh, the Miramar Community Garden is one of the oldest community gardens around here, and they um, most of their garden is it's got the it's got the um, the weed barrier and the grow bags with a little bit that's in ground. It's it's in a it's in a city park, uh, and uh, they're you know want to help people garden organically. Next, they irrigate with rain barrels, so that's cool. Next. So that's their that's their system with the grow bags. Next. Next. I think that's Rita. Next. I think that's the end of the okay. slides. Perfect. So all I want to add is another garden I just learned about that's that struggled was the Boca Raton Community Garden. Boca Raton's really fancy. Junior League was involved. But it still didn't stop development. They had to move the garden after 10 years for the Brightline train. And uh, Brightline's kicking in a few thousand to move the thing. 
So those are some of the challenges and some of the strengths, and, and that's the presentation. <laughs> Thank you so much, Judith. <laughs> tremendous. And I think that uh, everyone that's watching this right now is applauding your tremendous work. I'm doing that on screen. I don't know if my image is up or not, but <laughs> yes, just, just a tremendous you. work and so very, very impressive. Uh, and we'll look forward to the Q&A that will be coming up after Kitty's presentation. Um, now, we're now going to turn to Kitty Wallace and in another part of the state. Uh, Kitty is from the Tampa Bay region. So between our two presenters, we're covering a big chunk of the state of Florida. Uh, and I just want to say that there's much more that can be done following the kinds of models that Judy has presented and that Kitty is about to present. So that being said, it's my pleasure to turn this over to Kitty Wallace for our presentation on the Tampa Bay region and community gardens up this way. Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, our, the, our topic is what's been done and what's ahead. Next slide. I'm a person who has co-founded and managed a community garden in Tampa Heights for 10 years. And uh, we co-founded the uh, Coalition of Community Gardens as a network, which I'll describe later on. Um, I've attended a couple of the American Community Garden conferences, one in Indianapolis and Hartford. And I've toured gardens in several cities. And I have the good fortune that Lena Young Green is my partner. Next. She's my partner in developing all of these gardens that we have developed, and there's like a big project going on right now, which I didn't actually even include in this presentation. A brief history of community gardening in Florida. Victory Gardens, need to say no more. The resurgence of the gardens in the 70s due to the energy crisis. There was a survey done by the American Community Gardening Association in the 90s, and actually Sarasota was the only city in Florida that was found to have a community garden at that time. So we are now in the two, 2000s, and we are interested in our environment, our health, and our community, and so there's additional interest in community gardening. And you can see where we've come from the 1990s with mm -hmm. one city with gardens. So next. Well, a community garden is a single piece of land that's gardened collectively by a group of people. Um, and that's just your basic, you know, definition of a community garden. Next, there are many ways to organize a community garden, as many ways as there are people who get together and have an idea of how they want to do their garden, led by their children, led by other others in the community. Um, but where, where are we now? At the federal level, um, there is an Office of Urban Agriculture. It was established just two years ago with the 2018 Farm Bill. And its mission is to encourage and promote urban, indoor, and other emerging agricultural practices, including community composting and food waste reduction. So that's at the federal level, there is that type of support they had for the first year, this past year, one uh, grant that was sent <clears throat> out and lots of people applied for that Urban Agriculture Innovative Products Grant, including those of us here in Tampa, but we were not fortunate to have been awarded. So next, the importance of urban agriculture today is as we've seen, what's happened to us in, since March is that we'd see a fragile food system in place. There are flaws, there are gaps, there are components that break down. There is uh, an impact in food production and even meat processing plants being affected. So everyone is very keenly aware of this food system fragility. So we turn to solutions such as improving local production and increasing access to fresh, nutritious produce um, for the health of the community, for the health of the environment. Just a quick note on the research of uh, successful community gardens. Dr. Joseph England at USF researched what are the, the key factors that uh, can be attributed to a garden being successful because it's hard work and some gar sometimes gardens fail. But those that are successful have three components. They have uh, the, the people that belong to a successful garden feel very valued about the, the, the produce that they're uh, 
making in their garden, that they're creating, that they're eating for themselves. They feel secondly, very important about the meaningfulness of donating food to others. And thirdly, the celebrations that happen in the garden are very important to the success of the garden. Research on failed community gardens, uh, pretty much the biggie is drop a garden somewhere where no one wants it and it'll fail. Next. So the importance of having everyone in the community being a, a, a part of the development of the garden, setting the goals, planning the garden, and supporting the garden. What's ahead? Well, as we've seen, just a quick story about the Tampa Heights Community Garden, which has uh, 75 four by eight garden beds um, and is in a little curve of the world next to I-275 heading into downtown Tampa. We had uh, some gardens available in the for spring um, because we were doing a special project with our teens, not knowing that the world was going to change in March, and they were getting ready to do their entrepreneurial um, fresh market project. And so we had several gardens that were just growing extra veggies for the teens, but. Um, that that's all stopped. They went home for Easter break and never came back. So, uh, you know, in the course of due course, we had 12 new gardeners show up in the next month. By the end of April, we had all those teen gardens rearranged and we had new people uh, from right around the block. People hadn't been out walking, you know, and now they were. And they're like, what? Mm -hmm. We have a garden in our neighborhood? Mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> but I, I kept adding people. So and it was 12. Um, what's ahead? We want to talk about advocating for community gardens. They can play a very important role in improving local production and dis distribution at the local level. So I'm suggesting that you, you look at your area and see how you can help strengthen government support for community gardening. I did a, a research on several of our cities throughout the state, and there's a wide range of policies in each municipality. From the state level, the state of Florida supports front yard gardening, um, that infamous uh, uh, bill that was passed that disallowed home rule. So there is individual um, municipalities cannot uh, ban front yard gardens because of the state rule. And from the state level, there's the UF IFAS program throughout the state, and they provide publications and workshops and support. So they are very important. Next slide. But what is key for the, the, the growth of community gardens is that, that there is support from the local municipality. The mission of the community gardens, of course, to grow food, to grow community, and to care for the environment. What role can community gardens play in filling the local production gap? Well, they can grow food for their members, of course, but they can also grow additional food for a food ba bank. And many of the gardens in the Tampa Bay region, there are 35 community gardens in the four counties in our West Central wow. area, Hill Hillsborough, Pinellas, Pasco, and Manatee. Um, and it, even better than individual gardens determining that they will grow some for others would be if there was a network uh, to accomplish that goal. By forming a network, uh, more food can be uh, produced and a better distribution can be uh, planned. Next slide. So it's important, I'm advocating that people pay attention to what the food insecurity figures are near you. The USDA identifies census tracts as food deserts, low income census tracts with substantial numbers of residents with low levels of access to retail outlets selling healthy and affordable foods are defined as food deserts. And there is a food desert locator. You can find out, are you within a couple of miles of a food desert? Are you in a food desert? The U.S. Department of Agriculture de also defines food insecurity. So that's per that's a per person um, description rather than a neighborhood description. That you are persons who lack consistent access to enough food for an active, healthy life. Hillsborough County has a health survey, and probably each one of the counties 
has a their own health survey system and they've defined well they've asked the the following question in the 2019 survey have you been worried that you would not have food on the table in the next day or have you had it that you have not had food available on the next day and so they considered that you know kind of worried and actually have you been in that situation to define food insecurity? So next slide. In Hillsborough County, we have significant areas of food insecurity um, and food deserts. Just a quick note about an interesting book called uh, Food Town USA. Mark Wynn is um, a longtime advocate of um, local food and part of a, a team of people up in Hartford that have done a fabulous job with community gardening up there. He's now uh, just writing books and doing what he wants to do. He's a, a boomer like me. <laughs> and um, he went to seven different cities to identify what food systems were in place in these seven cities. And he discovered this uh, Alexandria, um, uh, Louisiana, and described it his descriptions are very, very good. He's got uh, cities all over uh, the uh, country that he uh, did some investigatory work. And this just struck me that their um, Economic Development Alliance there in central Louisiana is looking at the impact of uh, local food. And the, the research that they did said that there would be $91 million in value that could be added to the local economy if local consumer, consumers each directed $5 per week to purchasing local food. And that, I just was blown away by that. So, you know, that it's, it's not a little thing, it's a big thing. Um, and I also want to give a shout out to Dell for his presentations recently about food policy issues and how decisions can be made independently in families, as well as across um, governmental uh, decision making policy makers. But, it, you know, we can each make our own decisions about what we're going to eat and that we're going to go to the local food um, farmer market and, and uh, farm stand first to purchase uh, crops that are grown right in our nearby location. Next. So I'm also saying we can advocate for local policies that support community gardens, making connections with your extension office, with your universities, with your local government. Some examples of good, um, well-defined policies that support community gardening are those in St. Pete, in Fort Lauderdale, and in Orlando. And if you are watching this presentation like I do every last Friday of the month and enjoy so much that the Florida Food Policy Council has these presentations, I'm usually clicking <laughs> my phone and taking pictures of slides that I think will I will want to look at again. So you might want to look at St. Pete, Fort Lauderdale, and Orlando and see what their municipality, um, their policies are. Next. Current information about cities in um, the state of Florida, some have, you know, very well um, thought out policies and procedures for supporting community gardens. Some have staff that support community gardens or at least share the role. Um, some have special accommodations that their county has made in Miami, for instance, they have identified 12 districts that urban districts that would um, allow community gardening. And then they have listed the properties available in those 12 districts so that if people say, gosh, I wonder how, you know, how we could start a community garden, they can just take a few clicks and they can get some information that's very valuable. Orlando has a very active food policy council that supports their um, urban gardening efforts, Sarasota, uh, their county parks are the places where their community gardens are located. So that's a very supportive uh, 
posture for a community to take to allow uh, the community gardens to be in the parks. St. Pete has by far, they are just doing hands and uh, feet above <laughs> uh, in all kinds of ways and all many, many gardens that they have and their policies are uh, excellent. Tallahassee had some excellent policies. They have a food network that, that has been helpful in, in supporting community gardens. They also have a, a water waiver program so that if, if gardens are on a piece of property that needs to be connected to water, they can do that within the city structure. It doesn't have to be just, uh, you know, paid for. The, um, the cities across the country, and this is um, a report that's available if you want to, me to send it to you, we had an intern um, take on uh, a little task for our community garden group, for our coalition, um, from the Metropolitan Planning Organization in Hillsborough County. We were asked if there was something that we would like the intern to um, study for us. And so I gave them about five cities that I thought had, from my travels and going to the, the um, national conferences for the American Community Gardening Association, I'd run into these people and I knew something about their gardens. And I thought, I wonder how, how supported and how they, what is their, system in place because they they just all seem to have it all together so um i just um he's he's done a nice job of research and just real quickly you can see these are places that have had community gardens for a while the state of florida as i mentioned earlier we pr practically was non-existent until the early 2000s and it seemed to really start um uh, increasing the 2010, 2012, and now we're going to see another um, increase because of all that's gone on and the focus on local foods. But um, that's some information I thought would be helpful uh, if people wanted to research what other excellent uh, community gardening programs in cities um, of note. Next. So in, in Hillsborough, our community gardens in Hillsborough really started in around 2010. Um, we, by the time we got to about 2015, we had five gardens that had been successful for three or four years. But beyond that, uh, there was about a 50% failure rate of gardens who started for a year or two and then couldn't continue. And there was not really a specific support from extension they'd had. Uh, an agent that was uh, uh, available to support us for a little while, but she moved. They didn't re weren't able to replace her. There was not really a connection with the city or county government here in Hillsborough. So we just said to ourselves, maybe we should get together and maybe we should support each other. So we had a brainstorm session in 2015. And through that, we decided that, yes, those five of us that have been successful for three or four years, that's what we sort of uh, functionally defined as success. You've been around for three years and you still are around, then we're going to call you successful. So we established this network of community gardens, the mission to support the success of community gardening and to advocate for public policies to improve health through community gardening. Priority would be given to education and to sharing resources, and we've had an, an annual conference for the last three years. Um, we've also decided to participate in any kind of activity that we would get our name out. We have like a banner and we have brochures and we go sit there and, you know, collect names on a on a um, clipboard. Are you interested in community gardening? Where do you live? So that's what we did in uh, established the Coalition of Community Gardens in 2016, and we have um, continued to do things together. Let me go to the next slide. What we've done recently is looked at um, how we are situated in Hillsborough County in terms of uh, food deserts. So we have identified in yellow all of the areas that are identified as food deserts. We also have some in purple and pink or something that I didn't put on here because it's too confusing, but we also identified opportunity zones and community redevelopment areas and um, overlaid the community gardens. And then we're analyzing this to see what 
what how can we as community gardens in um, an urban area be uh, tuned in to the food needs of our fellow citizens next so when we saw all of that we said yeah we are kind of our gardens are kind of right in the middle of all of these food deserts how can we support them we can def network our gardens into five districts so we called them garden districts because that's sort of a she she sounding term so we have five <laughs> garden districts and we are looking this is just a it a very uh infancy of an idea to identify within each of these five garden districts the strengths and the weaknesses and to um, any other factors, transportation and so forth, and, and really uh, uh, drill down into the local issues. Next. Our idea was that if we had these five garden districts, we would identify a lead garden within each garden district. We would, we, this was our proposal to the USDA uh, urban ag grant. So we need money for this, but you know, now that we didn't get funded, we're looking for other ways to um, fund parts of this so that we could have uh, lead gardens supporting the member gardens, mentoring new gardens, creating a support system amongst those gardens to keep them from um, you know, running into difficulties, providing education, uh, collaborating, and setting up a garden market in each district so of the in the five garden districts there would be one um, lead garden with a market every saturday morning the other network gardens networking to that that hub would bring um, their produce next so we always think that uh we can have we can play a significant role certainly with our members in our garden, um, but we never can do things just by ourselves. We have partners and we like to celebrate our partners. We have um, community organizations and universities and business partners and government. Had to give a shout out to the city government of Newport Ritchie because they are also another excellent example of how city government supports community gardens. And next, and all of our community partners and this is just a one minute thing about the the logo in the top left the healthiest cities counties challenge that is um a grant that the etna foundation uh set out for 50 cities in the country and we applied for it and we were one of the 50 cities that got to spend a little bit of money to research and and um um develop uh, ideas about how to improve the health of our community. So we said, well, we will improve the health of our community by increasing access to fresh produce through gardening. And our partners in this challenge, which we named Garden Steps, which is the logo in the center, were uh, the Department of Health, Hillsborough County government, City of Tampa government, the Hillsborough Area Regional Trans Transit and the Metropolitan uh, Planning Organization, as well as the Coalition of Community Gardens. We put together a proposal. We were funded $10,000. And then after two years, we turned in our final um, uh, research and we were second in the country. So we got another $50,000 and we are um, we are creating um, an interesting uh, urban garden uh, corridor in um, an area that comes a street that comes straight down from the university down to Ybor City. It's a really long street. We're going to start with the small part, but our intention is uh, in the area of 22nd Street that is in the food desert neighborhoods of East Tampa, we'll be developing all types of garden programs and making um, fresh produce available. and by so doing, encouraging people to garden in their front yards. That's it. Great, thank you. Thank you. Wonderful. Wonderful. Thank you, Kitty. And thank you, Judy.
Uh, two tremendous presentations and inspiring, quite frankly. Uh, I think anyone that's watching this that is not doing a community garden right now is going to want to get out and get started. Absolutely. And I just want to note to everyone who's listening that um, this is a document that will be posted on the Florida Food Policy Council website, and you can use it over and over and over again to inspire yourself, but also to assist you in making a pitch to your local government or local organizations that may want to support you. Kitty mentioned a number of metropolitan uh, 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 systems, number of cities that are involved in this. And Judith mentioned um, the Rotary Club, uh, a civic organization that's involved. So use this to help promote uh, the idea of, of community gardens in your own area. That being said, uh, Kendra, we want to open it up to some questions now. So I'm going to- I just, I just, sorry, I just want to jump in and yeah. say I forgot before to acknowledge my co-organizers who are on this call, Satya Rudin and Jackie Ida. Well, thank you so much, Judy. And uh, we acknowledge them also along with you. Um, Kendra, we want to open it up now uh, for a few questions. We don't have a lot of time left, but uh, let's maybe look at some of the uh, questions in the chat box. Um, yes, well, thank you both for those fantastic presentations. Thanks everyone for being with us today. Um, if you don't um, get a question answered, please reach out to us at info at flfpc.org. We'll make sure to get your questions to the right people and answered. We did have uh, one question from Danny. She asked, how much do garden membership fees actually sustain the garden's functions? And what are some other non-financial ways I can contribute to the garden and their team? Well, I would say that um, most community gardens, garden fees are somewhere between 40 and $50 a year. Um, and most community gardens have uh, s scholarships available. Um, and in our community garden, we have two fundraisers a year. So between our membership fees and our fundraisers, we're able to sustain the needs of the garden. We buy soil, we uh, you know repair lumber, we do this and that. If we need to do something extra, we write a grant for that, like we put in an aquaponic system and a solar power system. So all those had to be done by grants. All yeah, right, we have a similar good. situation. I think it depends. Like, I don't know if Jeannie's still on, on the yes. call, but if you have to pay rent, it's very different than when you don't. Yes, uh, we pay, I, I'm from the Delray Beach Children's Garden, I'm the co-founder of it, and uh, we started out uh, with, pro well, we have property that we rent from uh, a church, and uh, for the first two years that we were in existence, we paid $10 a year, and really helped get us started, and yeah. then, uh, but administration changed at the church, they need money, we pay eight seventy five a month, they'd like to raise it to $1,000 a month. Uh, and we've been able to do that with programming. We've been fairly successful with the homeschool program, uh, with fundraisers. We are a private nonprofit. We receive no funding from the city. Uh, we did have a $100,000 grant from Impact 100, which is a local um, funding source. And, uh, and that lasted for two years. We're, we're right on the edge of, of moving out of that. Uh, we're looking for additional uh, sources of funding. Uh, I've been looking at a, a lot of alternative sources. Uh, uh, during COVID, I started uh, researching, well, who's making money right now? And uh, yes. it has a philanthropic spirit. And, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, and I Amazon. found the CBD, the CBD <laughs> industry and the cannabis industry. Uh -huh. uh, there's actually uh, an organization called CannabisDoingGood.com uh, out of Colorado. Uh, awesome. And their organization, their, their companies, like Charlotte's Web is an example. Uh, mm. Charlotte's Web was started yeah. by a woman who needed CBD for her daughter, Charlotte, um, right. MS. Right. And uh, so now that company uh, last year made $97 million. Uh, and they're giving away a million dollars to take away the stigma of um, providing CBD okay. for children. All right, that's great. Thank, thank you so much, Jeannie. Uh, Kendra, can we go on to another question? Uh, maybe one more before we run out of time? Yeah. We do have uh, Gabriel Morgan. Thanks, Jeannie. His hand is raised. Gabriel, would you like to unmute and ask? Yeah, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Yeah. Can you hear me? Hello? Yes, yes. yes. 
I, I just wanted to say uh, uh, for, for Judy's presentation, uh, both excellent, but I had a question. There was a, a garden on a church property that also had an outdoor kitchen, uh, but yes. I, I came into the meeting just at the end, and I didn't catch what the name of that was. Um, could you could you share that again? Yes, that is the Fruitful Field in Pompano Beach. Fruitful Field. Thank mm -hmm. you. Thank you. It, it's very similar model to ours. Is the reason I'm interested. I'd like to take our group over there. Wonderful. Where are you, Gabriel? A Faith Lutheran Church on North Florida Avenue. We have a gift center garden, and we are partnered with uh, Seeds of Hope Community Garden, which is First United Church of Tampa. Yeah. Um, North right. Tampa, yeah. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Pastor Morgan. Uh, uh, Kendra, how about one last question, and then we will uh, wrap it up. Yes, Arlie had a great question, which was, how can we integrate community gardens more effectively with economic development initiatives and other similar solutions in interrelated issues like workforce, housing, um, health connections, those kinds of things? In my opinion, we have to be at the table where these discussions are happening, where these uh, community groups are getting together. And so it. Uh, this structure of community gardens in my world without a connection to city government means that we don't know when these things are happening. So we're constantly like, uh, maybe we could be invited to that. So if you live in, in a area where you have a connection to your sustainability program and they take some ownership and support of your community gardens, they could uh, identify the, the times and the places where a uh, community garden representative could go and help, you know, try to remind people that we could be helpful too. Yeah, I, I agree with that, um, uh, Kitty. Um, I, let me just underscore that for anyone that's interested in doing a community garden or getting one started or maintaining one, the connection with city government or county government is of extreme importance. Absent that, gardens often have a hard go of it. Not always, but often have a hard go of it. And um, based on my experience, and I have been involved in community gardening myself for going on 20 years, the key is getting advocacy at the elected government level from city council, county commissioners, people that are holding the actual political power within the area that you're in to get an advocate, not just somebody that's kind of modestly supporting what you're doing, but an advocate, someone that will work with you for the success of your garden is of extreme importance and often the key to long-term success. Um, well, and we I don't do, have I'm much sorry, time left. Sorry, I just want for two oh, seconds yeah, sure, to, jump, Judy. to jump in and reinforce what Natalia Earl just mentioned in the chat. I did not mention the Dania Beach patch because it's a market garden rather than a community garden, although they, I think they have a little of that too, but they're, they've really focused on those linkages that we're just trying to describe. A absolutely. Thank you, Judy, for reinforcing that point uh, and your colleague as well who did. Uh, we're getting a tremendous number of questions that are coming in in the chat box, but unfortunately, we're out of time. <laughs> so I'm sorry to say that. Uh, we want to say just a bit about what's coming up next month. So I'm going to turn it over to Kendra, and then I'm going to uh, offer one final remark at the end. So Kendra, can you tell us about our next month's uh, Florida Food Forum? Yes, so our next month's forum is going to be the very last Friday of January, January 29th. It's going to be on the topic of building bridges, bettering Florida's food system together. So our speakers on this forum are going to be all of our board members, uh, which will be very exciting to hear about what each of our board members is doing in their respective areas of expertise to better the Florida food system. So we hope you can all join us. Um, and of course, as always, thank you for joining us today. We will be posting a recording of this forum on our YouTube channel and our website within the next few days. Um, and we hope you can can join us for the next one. Thank, thank you so much, Kendra. And thank you to our two outstanding uh, guests, uh, Judy and Kitty. I applaud them. I don't know if I'm up on the screen or not, but we are applauding their work <laughs> and thanking well, them profusely. 
Uh, we thanks, applaud you. Been, this has been a tremendous presentation. And again, I just want to underscore the point that this will be posted on the website. So please go to it and refer others to it. If you're on the mailing list, you'll get information about the January Florida Food Forum. And remember, it's the last Friday of every month, right at noon. Great time. Tell others to join. I want to thank uh, also uh, FHEED and Jay Haskins Law for sponsoring this uh, Florida Food Forum. And I also want to encourage others to think about sponsoring Florida Food Forum. There's information on the website. And if you don't care to sponsor one of the forums, please consider membership in the Florida Food Policy Council. It's a one of a kind organization that really is supported at all only through the support that we get from members and from sponsors. So on behalf of the Florida Food uh, Policy Council and on behalf of the entire leadership of the board, as well as all participants, we thank you for joining this work, joining us today, and please consider joining us for the long term. My best to everyone and especially our two presenters. See you next month. Bye now. Bye. Bye. Thank you.